Ivan Niklov Niklovich went on to send an encoded message, message to headquarters. The next morning, there was an emergency session of Russian military council. Protection was organized around the settlement where Ivan Niklovich's homestead was located. The guards tried to be discreet and the soldiers wore road, wore road worker uniforms. Five kilometers from the settlement, on its outskirts, they allegedly began building a, a ring road building. At every meter, simultaneously, simultaneously, day and night, television cameras were installed at Ivan Nikolovich Homestead to follow every minute of little Dasha's life. The picture was transmitted to a center resembling a space flight mission control center. Tens of specialists, psychologists, and military personnel prepared to give the necessary instructions in the event of an emergency, kept continuous vigil at the monitors. Specialists, psychologists, with the help of a special link, were constantly giving Widow Dasha's parent recommendation about how to distract her with something to keep her from falling into contemplation again. The Russian government made an international statement that seemed odd to many, which said that there were forces in Russia capable of exploding any type of armament, no matter where they were. These forces were not wholly under the control of the Russian government, but talks were being held with them. The unlikelihood of the statement demanded confirmation an international council decided to manufacture a series of unusual shaped projectiles. They were manufactured with square cartridge cases. Each of the countries participating in the experiment took 20 of these projectiles and hid them in different places on their territory. But why do they make the product projectiles with square cartridge cases? Why couldn't they use ordinary ones, I asked Anastasia. Vladimir, they were afraid that not only all existing projectiles in the world might blow up, but also the bullets in the magazines of police and military guns, everyone carrying a weapon with ammunition. Yes, of course. And how did the, ex how, and how did the experiment with square pro projectiles go? Ivan Niklovich called his little daughter Dasha into his study showed her the photograph of the square projectile and asked her to blow them up. Dasha looked at the photograph and said, I love you very much, Papa dear, but I can't carry out your request. Why, Ivan Nikovich was amazed. Because it won't work. Why won't it, Dashnika? It did before. You blew up a whole series of modern missiles, but now it won't. I was so upset then, Papa dear. I didn't want you to go away and sit so many hours at your computer. When you sit at your computer, you don't talk to anyone and don't do anything interesting. But now you're always nearby. You become very good, dear Papa, so I can't make anything explode. Ivan Niklovich realized that Dasha was incapable of blowing up the square projectiles because the goal of blowing them up, the point wasn't clear to her. Ivan Niklovich paced agitatedly around his study, thinking feverishly about how to find a solution. He began heatedly trying to convince Dasha he talked to his daughter as if he were reasoning with himself. It won't work. Yes, that's too bad. There have been wars in the world, world for millennia. Wars ended between some. And others started to fight. Millions of people died and are dying now. Huge amounts of monies are spent on weapons. There was an opportunity to put a stop to this endless destructive process. But unfortunately, Ivan Niklovich looked at Dasha sitting in the chair. His daughter's face was calm. She watched with interest as he paced around his study and spoke. But the meaning of the words uttered did not upset Dasha. 
she did not completely realize what was what war was, what kind of money he was talking about and who was spending it. She was thinking her own thoughts. Why is Papa pacing around his study, so upset among the unkind computers, which don't give out any energy? Why doesn't he want to go out into the orchard? Where the trees are blooming and the birds are singing, where every blade of grass and every twig on the tree caresses your whole body with something invisible. Mom and my brother Kosia are there now. I hope Papa stopped this boring talk so we can go out into the orchard together. When Mama and Kosia see them, they'll be so happy. Mama will smile and yesterday Kosia promised to tell me how to. And yesterday Kosia promised to tell me how. You can touch a distant star by touching a pebble or a flower. Kosia always keeps his promises. Dashenka, am I boring you? Do you not understand what I've said? Ivan Nikolovich addressed his daughter. Are you thinking your own thoughts? Papa dear, I'm thinking. Why are you and I here and not in the orchard where everything is waiting for us? Ivan Nikolovich realized he needed to speak more sincerely and, and specifically with his daughter, so he began. Dashenka, when you blew up the missile by looking at their picture, the idea was born to verify your abilities one more time, or rather to show the whole world Russia's ability to destroy all the armaments in the world. Then there would be no point producing them, no point in danger. In dangers. People themselves would destroy those already made. Universal disarmament would begin. The square projectors were manufacture, manufactured specially so that you could demonstrate your abilities without anyone dying in the process. Blow them up, Dashenka. I can't do that now, Papa dear. Why you could? Why you could before and now you can't? I promised myself never to blow anything up again. And since I promise, I don't have the ability to blow anything up now. You don't? But why did you promise yourself? Brother Coaster showed me pictures in his book of how people's bodies fly to pieces from explosion. How people are scared of explosions. How trees fall and die from explosions. So I promised myself. Dashenka, does that mean you can never do it now, even just one more time, just one? These square projectiles here. Ivan Nikolovich held out a photograph of the square projectile to his daughter. They were manufactured especially and hidden in secluded places in different countries. There aren't any people next to them or even nearby. Everyone is waiting to see whether or not they'll blow up. Blow them up, daughter. This will not be breaking your promise. No one will perish on the contrary. Dasha looked at the photograph of the square projectile again, indifferently, and replied calmly. If I take back my promise, those projectiles still won't blow up, Papa dear. But why? Because you talk too much, Papa dear. And when I look at the photograph, I immediately dislike the square goblins. They're ugly and now. What now, Dashenko? What? Forgive me, please, Papa dear. But you talk so much after you showed them to me that since then, they've been almost entirely eating up. Eating up? What's been eating up? The square projectors, projectiles are newly eaten up. As soon as I didn't like the projectiles, I could tell. They'd been set in motion and started eating them up very, very fast. Who are they? Oh, the little ones. They're around us everywhere and inside us. They're good, Kosa says. They're bacterial or microorganism. 
but I'd rather call them my nice little ones. They like that more. Sometimes I play with them. People pay almost no attention to them, but they always try to do something good for each person. When a person rejoices, the joyous energy makes him feel good. When a person is angry or breaks something living, they perish in great numbers. Others rush to take the place of those who have perished. Sometimes others do not manage to replace the dead and the human body falls ill. But you are here, Dashenka, and the missiles are hidden far away underground in different countries. How could they, well, these little ones learn of your desires so quickly in other countries? Oh, they tell each other everything in a chain, a lot faster. The electrons run in your computer. My computer, communication, just a second. I'm going to verify everything. Video cameras have been installed around every missile in our territory. I'll be just a second. Ivan Nikolovich turned toward his communication computer. The image of a square projectile glowed on the monitor. Or rather, what was left of the projectile. The cartridge cage was rusty and full of holes and the warhead was lying nearby and significantly smaller. Ivan Nikolovich switched screens, but the same thing had happened to the other projectiles. The image of a man in military uniform appeared on the screen. Hello, Ivan Nikolovich. You yourself have already seen everything. What conclusion has the council drawn? Ivan Nikolovich asks, the council members, members have divided up into groups and our consulting security. Security is trying to work out additional safety measures for the site. Don't call my daughter site. Don't call my daughter a site. You're nervous, Ivan Neklovich, and in this situation that is Im impermissible. In ten minutes an expert group consistent of leading specialists, psychologists, biologists, and radio electronics specialists will be joining you. They are, already en route. they are already en route. Set up the communication with your daughter. Prepare her. What opinions are most of the council members inclining toward? For now, toward your family's total isolation within the bonds of your homestead. You must immediately clear out all images of technical devices. Remain by your daughter's side and try to keep a constant watch on her. The group of specialists from the military council who arrive at Ivan Nikolovich Homestead spoke with little Dasha for an hour and a half. The child patiently answered the adult's question, but after an hour and a half, something happened that completely confused all the specialists present at the homestead and all those observing what was, what was happening from the security council center on our huge monitors. After an hour and a half of talking with little Dasha, the door of Ikon Ivan Nikolovich's expensive study opened. Dasha's brother, Kosha, walked into the study. He was carrying the cuckoo clock, which was cuckooing continuously. Kosha put the clock on the desk. The clock hands were at 11. And when the mechanical cuckoo was supposed to finish the specific number of cuckoos, the big hand of the clock quickly circled the clock face and the cuckoo started over from the beginning. And silence those present look at the clock's bizarre movement. And then Dasha baffled. I, Dasha suddenly explained, I completely forgot. I have to go take care of something important. It's my friend Venuka who's spinning the hands. That's what we agreed. If I forget, I have to go. Two guards blocked the exit from the study. What will you forget, Dashenka? Ivan Nikolovich asked his daughter. I forgot to go to the homestead where my friend Renishka lives and struck a little flower and water it. Otherwise, it's sad without caressing. It's like it likes to be looked at tenderly. But the flower isn't yours after all. Ivan Nikolovich commented to his daughter. 
Why can't your friend stroke it yourself? It herself, her own flower. Papa dear Varunuka and her friend and her parents went on a visit. A visit where? Somewhere in Siberia. Exclamation by those present uttered nearly in a whisper were heard on all slides. She's not the only one. What ability does your friends have? Your friend have? She's not the only one. How many are there? How can they how can they be determined? You must take immediate measures for each stop for for each such child. All the exclamation subsides as soon as an elderly graying man sitting in the edge rose from his seat. This man was senior in rank and position, not only among the people present in Ivan Nevlukov's study, he was chairman of the Russian Security Council. Everyone turned toward him and fell silent. The gray hair man looked at Dasha, sitting in her little wooden armchair, and a tiny tear rolled down his cheek. And the gray hair man slowly walked up to Dasha, dropped to one knee before her, and reach out to her. Dasha stood up, took a step, and picking up the hem of her skirt, dropped her curtsy and put her little hand in his palm. The gray hair man looked at her for a while, then bowed his head and respectfully kissed Dasha's hand, said, Forgive us, please, little goddess. My name is Dasha, the little girl replied. Yes, of course your name is Dasha. Tell us, what must be on our earth? The little girl looked with surprise into the elderly man's face, drew close to him, cautiously wiped the little tear from his face with her palm, and touched his mustache with her finger. Then she turned toward her brother. Kosa, you promised to help me be with the lilies in Veronica's ponds. Do you remember your promise? Yes, Kosa answered. Then let's go, let's go. Dasha stopped at the doorway after passing the guards who had parted before her, turned to the man still kneeling on one knee, smiled at him and said confidently, What must be on earth is goodness. Six hours later, speaking at an extended session of the Russian Security Council, the gray hair chairman said, Everything in the world is relative, relative to our generation. The new one is akin to God's. We must come even with it, not it with us. All the military might might of the planet with its unique technical achievements prove powerless before this one little girl of the new generation. Our task, our duty, and our obligation before this new generation is to clear away the trash. We must apply all our efforts toward clearing the earth of all weaponry. Our technical achievements and the discoveries embodied in the most modern and as we thought, unique military complexes turn out to be unnecessary junk in the face of the new generation, and we have to clear it away. Disarmament race. An international conference was held for the Security Council of the military blocs of the different countries and continents. Their plans were worked out for the emergency recycling of military equipment and ammunition. Scientists from different countries exchanged their experience in recycling technologies. Psychology spoke constantly in the media trying to avert a panic among the populace, which own various types of firearms. Panic arose after news of the Russian phenomenon was leaked to the media. 
the facts were somewhat distorted. Several Western news sources spoke about how Russia was recycling their ammunition on its territory on an emergency basis and was preparing at X hour to blow up the military reserves of other countries, destroying in the process the majority of the population. People started throwing the firearms and ammunitions they had into the rivers and burying them in wastelands because the official recycling depots could not accept them from those who wanted to turn them in. Fines were set for unauthorized recycling. Middlemen firms took large payment for accepting each cartridge. But this did not stop those who wanted, who wanted, to, from, who wanted to from getting rid of what presented a threat to the lives of entire families. The people of cities located close to military bases demanded that the authorities immediately, immediately eliminate military sites. But the defense industry, which had been refocused to recycle what it had previously produced, was working at the limit of its capacity as it was. The press of many Western countries began to spread more and more rumors about how Russia was threatening the world with disaster. The world could not get rid of its accumulated weapons, and many enterprises recycling military arms and ammunition were working at the limit of their capacity. They could not destroy the weapons produced over a decade in just a few months. The Russian government was accused of allegedly knowing for a long time about these unusual children and of preparing well beforehand to recycle lethal weapons. To confirm these rumors, the fact was cited that the Russian government had engaged in buying up and dissembling ecologically unreliable enterprises, not only in its own country, but those in countries close to Russia's borders. If Russia was the first to clear its territory of explosive weapons, it would have the opportunity to destroy countries lagging in the disarmament race. They intentionally exaggerate all the possible devastation and consequences of a world ca catastrophe. Firms that recycle ammunition found this very profit profitable since the price for their service rose. For example, someone turning a gun cartridge for recycling had to pay $20 per cartridge. Unauthorized burial or disposal of a weapon was viewed as an act of sabotage. Panic was also mounting because no one could propose effective protection from the powers discovered in Russian children. The Russian, presided, the, the, the Russian president agreed to what everyone then thought to be a desperate and ill-considered step. He decided to appear live on air over all channels of world television, surrounded by children with unusual abilities. When the day and time of the Russian president live appearance was announced, nearly the entire population of the planet gathered by their television screens. Just ahead of this hour, many enterprises stopped work. Stores closes and the streets were deserted. People awaited the news from Russia. The Russian president wanted to, wanted to use his appearance to reassure people and to show the whole world that the generation of the Russian being born were not bloodthirsty monsters, monsters but good ordinary children, and there was no need to fear them. In order to be more convincing, the Russian president asked his assistants to assemble in his office about 30 children with unusual abilities and decided to remain alone in the office with those children. Everything was done in just this way. What did the Russian president tell the world community? If, we, if you would like... If you like, you can see the this, this scene for yourself and hear what was said, Vladimir. Yes, I would like that. Watch. Russia's president stood at a small podium next to his desk. Children of different ages from about 3 to 10 sat on little chairs on either side of the podium. Near the opposite wall of the office were journalists with television cameras. The president began to speak. 
Ladies and gentlemen, fellow citizen, I have invited you especially to meet the children, as you yourself will be convinced. I am in this office with them alone, without a guard, psychologist, or parents. These children are not the monsters many media in the West have attempted to portray. You yourself can see that these are ordinary children. Their faces and actions show no signs of aggressiveness. We consider some of their abilities unusual. But is that in fact the case? The abilities that have begun to be discovered in the new generating generation may be ordinary for the human, human individual. What may be unusual and unacceptable for human existence are our creations. The humans community has created a system of communication and military potential capable of leading our planets to cat catastrophe. Over the centuries, peace talks have been held between the states with the greatest military power, but the arms race has not stopped. Today, there is a real opportunity to put an end to this endless destructive process. Right now, those countries where lethal weapons are not concentrated are in the most advantaged position. For us, this position appears unnatural. But let's think hard about why we so deeply believe that the production of lethal weaponry threatened the entire nation with man's Annihilation is natural. The new generation has changed its priorities and forced us to move in the opposite direction, to disarm. The fear, panic, and fevered actions that are accompanying this process has been created largely thanks to the distortions of the news. The Russian government has been accused of long knowing about the appearance in its country of children with unusual abilities. These, these accusations are groundless. Russia still has a lot of military potential. And like many countries, we are doing everything possible to recycle it. The Russian government has been accused of not trying to discover all the children with unusual abilities and not taking action to isolate them which implies forcible hypnotism until the disarmament process is, is complete. The, gov the Russian government will not agree to this step. Russian children are full-fledged citizens of our country. Let us think about this desire to isolate those who do not accept the weapons of murder rather than those who produce them. The Russian government is taking measures to avert an accidental emotional outburst among children capable of sending an impulse and blowing up a type of weapon they dislike. Films displaying killing weapons have been completely banned from Russian television channels. Toys that imitate weapons have been destroyed. Their parents are by their parents' side, constantly in, and try to ward off the negative reaction. The president broke off his speech. A tow-headed boy of five or so stood up and walked toward a trip a tripod a tripod supporting a video camera. First he simply examined the tripod screws and when he grabbed them, the operator ab abandoned his camera and retreated behind the journalist back in flight. Backs in flight. The president quickly walked up to the boy who had frightened the cameraman took his hand and led him to the chair where he had been sitting quietly before, murmuring as they went, please sit quietly until I finish. But he was unable to continue his speech. Two children of three or four were doing something with the communication equipment near the desk. The children who had been sitting quietly since the beginning of the speech scattered through the office and did different things. Only the older children and there were very few of them, sat in their places, examining the journalists and television cameras. Among them was a girl with ribbons and her hair, and I recognized her, Dasha, who
who had blown up modern missile complexes, assessing what was going on in a very unchildishly intelligent and careful way, was observing the journalist's reaction. People glued to, te to their television screens all over the world, world saw the Russian president's slightly distraught face. He looked at the children scattered up through his office. He saw two children, children doing something with the government cameras and looked at the door outside of which his assistants and the invited children parents were but did not call to anyone for help. The president apologized for his interrupt speech, quickly walked up to two children who were dragging one of the devices of his, um, of, off his desk, picked them up under their arms and said, these are not your toys. One of the boys who found himself behind, held up by the president, saw his pal hanging from the president's other side and laughed out gay gaily. The second child squirming, tugged on the president's tie and said, they are. That's what you think, but they aren't. They're toys, the, smile child, the smiling child repeatedly merely. The president saw a few more children attracted by the blinking color lights and sound, walk up and start touching the telephone receivers. Then he put the two fidgers down on the floor, walked quickly to his desk, pressed a button and said, immediately turn off all communication in my office. Then he quickly spread out blank pieces of paper on his desk. He put a pencil out pen, he put a pencil or pen on each and said, turning to the kids crowding around him, here you go, you can draw whatever you want. Draw and then we'll all look and see who's turned out the best. The children surrounded the desk to take paper and pencils or pens. The shorter ones couldn't reach the desk, so the president began pulling up chairs and sitting or standing the little ones on the chair. Chairs. Convinced that he had distracted the children with drawing, the president once again walked up to his podium, smiled at the television views, gathered air into his lungs, intending to continue his speech and couldn't. A little boy walked up to him and started tugging at his trouser. What's this? What do you need? P, the child said, what? P, P, you mean you need to go to the bathroom? And the president looked at the office door again. The door opened and two of the president assistants to guard quickly rushed to him. One of the men with a stern and somewhat tense face leaned over and took the child by the hand. But the child, not letting go of the president's trouser leg, squirmed away jerk his hand out of that of the stern man pulling him out of the office and made a gesture of protest toward the other man approaching. The men who had come in were at a loss. The child raised his little face again and looking up at the president, tugged at his trousers again and said, pee, and he squatted a little. You picked a bad time with your pee, <clears throat> and you're also very hard to please, the president said, quickly picking the child up in his arms and apologizing to the journalist, and headed to the door, saying as he went, well, be quick, and he, and he walked out. On the screens of hundreds of millions of television, the television cameras showed the children playing, drawing, and take, talking to each other. Most often they showed the president podium when no one stood. And then little Dasha rose from her seat. She took her, she took her chair, dragged it to the president, to the presidential podium, climb on the chair, look at the journalists and into the camera's lens, aim at her, straighten the bow, bows on her braids, the, straighten the bows on her braids and begin to speak. My name is Dasha. Our president is a nice man. He'll be right back. He'll be back and he'll tell you everything. He's a little nervous, 
but he'll be able to tell everyone how good it's going to be everywhere on earth and that no one should be afraid of us. My brother Kostya told me that people are afraid of us children now because I blew up the big new the big new missiles. But I didn't just want to blow them up. I wanted to keep my papa from leaving us for long times and for my papa not to think so much about these missiles and not to look at them. He should look at mama. She's better than all the missiles. She's so happy when papa looks at her and talks to her. But when he goes away for a long time or looks at missiles, mama is sad. And I don't want my mama to be sad. Kosia, my brother, is very smart and sensible. And Kosia says I've scared lots of people. I won't blow anything up anymore. That's not interesting at all. There are other things to do that are very important and interesting. They will bring you joy. To, they will bring joy to everyone. And you will take part the missiles yourself so that no one can ever blow them up. Please don't be afraid of us. Come visit us, all of you. We'll give you all life-giving waters to drink. My mama told me how people here used to live. They were about their business and built different factories and plants and got so carried away that all of a sudden there was, a, there was no life-giving water left. The water got dirty and they only sold water and bottles in stores. But the water and bottles is dead, suffocated, and people started getting sick. That was how it used to be. But I just couldn't imagine how people could pollute the water they themselves were drinking. But my papa said that even now on earth, there were whole countries where there was any living. Clean water and people in those countries are dying from agonizing disease. There aren't any apples in those countries or delicious berries because everything living is sick. And a person who eats something sick suffers. You should come visit, visit us all. Come visit and we'll treat you to apples that aren't sick and tomatoes and pears and berries. You try them and when you go home, you tell yourself, we shouldn't pollute it's better to live in cleanliness. And when you have everything clean, we'll come visit you with present. The president who had returned, carrying the little boy, was standing in the door and listened to Dasha speak. And when she fell silent, he walked up to the podium, still holding the child who was comfortable in his arms, and added, yes, of course, you should come indeed. You can heal your flesh here. But this is not the main thing. Most important is for us all to understand ourselves and our purpose. We must understand this so we aren't cleared off the face of the earth like trash. Together we must all clean up. After ourselves, clear away the dirt we created. Thank you all for your attention. The scene in the president's office disappeared and Anastasia's voice continued. It's hard to say whether the president's speech or little Dasha had influence on the people listening to the live broadcast from Russia, but people didn't want to believe the rumors being spread about Russia's aggressiveness anymore. People wanted to live and to live happily, and they believe in that possibility. Those wanting to visit Russia and spend time there increased many times after the direct broadcast from Kremlin. Those who returned from Russia could no longer live their former life, and awareness blazed up in each of them like the first ray of sun in the morning's dawn.